We are in Fate and Destiny, uh, and we have been. I'm going to start on page 19 at the beginning of that paragraph, the, sec, the first full paragraph on the page. What's going on here is, again, Rabbi Soloveitchik is asking uh, not why bad things happen to good people, but what can we learn uh, for the person going through the problem? What is, he's, what is the halachic response to that sort of thing? In other words, what does he have to do? What is, he, what is God trying to tell him that he's missing in his life? Not so much, again, why, why is it happening? That one we don't get into. That it's more of, what can I learn from this experience? That's really where he's going. So again, uh, it starts like this. The teaching of the rectification of suffering, when put into practice, demands of the sufferer both courage and discipline. He must find with him, within himself and draw upon prodigious resources and subject himself to a rigorous self-examination and self-evaluation untainted by the slightest hint of partiality or self-indulgence. He must contemplate his past and envision his future with complete and unwavering honesty. It's something we don't like to do. If you would ask a person why they did whatever they do, they will have a thousand excuses as to why they did what they did. Instead of just realizing, I should not have done that. Okay, we always come up with a nice excuse. And what he's saying to us is when, when you have suffering, what you have to do is have courage and really look at yourself square in the face or in the mirror, whatever you want to do, and say, what, how can I improve myself? Again, not why it's happening, but what can I do to improve myself? Because if I improve myself, the natural result of following the mitzvot is Hashem will remove all these things from me. Okay, it was not easy for, me, for Job to mend his suffering. Remember, he went through this whole thing, 40, 45 chapters worth of uh, convincing the people why he didn't deserve this. So it was not easy for him to do it. And we as well, faint-hearted and weak-willed, as we are bound in the chains of fate, which is, remember how we define fate. Fate is a passive situation. Something's happening to me as compared to destiny, which the Rav is arguing is active. I make my destiny. So he's saying so we're bound to these chains of fate, saying it's going to happen no matter what I do, and lacking personal fortitude. Are now called upon, these same people are now called upon by divine providence to clothe ourselves in a new spirit, to elevate ourselves to the rank of the rectification of our afflictions, afflictions which are demanding of us that we provide them with their deliverance and redemption. It's a beautiful way, by the way, to look at bad things that are happening to you. Mm -hmm. Is as we would say, they're a kapara, they're an atonement. But again, I have to recognize their ability to atone for whatever it is. But I also have to now look and say, what am I doing? How can I improve my relationship with God if I know and let, let's be more simplistic about this. Let's say that I make brachot, but I'm running through it. Or I, what's going on is I sometimes will get up from the table before saying Berkat Amazon. I didn't bench. I didn't say the grace after meals. So, and I may forget. So you have to be careful with that. And so on and so forth. Take the simplest things in life that I didn't, when I put my shoes on, I don't, I'm not really careful to put my right shoe on first, then my left shoe, tie my left shoe, tie my right shoe, untie my right shoe, untie my left shoe, take off my left shoe, take off my right shoe. I'm not careful with that. Okay? And so that could be what it is. I'm not, if I'm not careful in that rabbinic injunction, I may not be careful in the biblical injunction. One thing will lead to another. I, the best thing is for us to think about this is the stop sign. We all see stop signs. The question is, do you stop, come to a complete stop at the stop sign, or do you do what most people do? You slow down and roll past it. <laughs> okay? So if I slow down and roll past it, I'm breaking the law. So the same thing with the Torah. If I'm willing to break the rabbinic law, sooner or later I'm going to come to break biblical law. So I shouldn't break the rabbinic, nor should I break the, uh, the uh, biblical. So from th for this purpose, 
We need to examine our own reflection with spiritual heroism and total objectivity. Because again, we love our excuses. We, we will come up with a thousand reasons why nothing's really different. Why should I be being, why am I, uh, why should God suddenly want to punish me now? This ref and it's much easier to blame fate than to blame myself. I always want to blame somebody else. That's very easy to do. But once I blame myself, take a, take a, uh, again, square on the chin. So that's, that's a lot of spiritual heroism going on there. That I have to say to myself, what am I doing wrong? What, how can I improve? Again, it's, I'm not saying that that's the direct cause of what's happening. Because you could have done something five years ago. And God has a long time to pay back. It's something we have to always understand. God doesn't pay back instantaneously. Otherwise, we would know not to sin. But the fact of the matter is that we keep going, keep going, keep going. And sooner or later, that's when Hashem says, okay, enough is enough. Now I have to wake you up a little, a little more than uh, giving you a kiss on the cheek. I have to hit you a little. Okay, fine. This reflection breaks through both past and present together in order to confront us directly. If the gracious divine bounties which have been showered upon both the individual and the community obligate their beneficiary to perform special concrete deeds, even if these bounties like wealth, honor, influence, and power, and the like, which are acquired through exhaustive labor, have been bestowed upon man in a natural manner, how much more so to the divine bounties, which are bequeathed in a supernatural manner in the form of a miracle, which takes place outside the context of the basic lawfulness governing the, I hope I said this right, concatenation, concatenation of historical events. I said that right? Good, okay. Concatenation, by the way, is connected like a chain, right? There you go. I tell you, when, when the Rav speaks, get your dictionary out. He's, he's the guy. That's right. He just follows his dictionaries. Okay. Anyway, so he's governing the concatenation of historical events. Bind the, miracle, the miracles uh, beneficiary to God. So again, even though in one case, like the honor, influence, and power, I have to acquire, it doesn't come to me overnight. It takes a long time to get there. And when I do it, I'm saying it's all me. No, it's not all me. That's all God. And I have to recognize that just as I would with the supernatural powers. I, I know from the reading that he studied a lot of Latin. Oh, yeah. The, these, you know, these terms are just not used by anybody that didn't study Latin. He was he used he uh, the Rav studied this he also as a big scholar. philosopher. He he was very very educated, and interesting enough, I mean it's a side point of the Rav and of Yeshiva University, but the one thing that the Rav wanted was for the American rabbinate to be educated and to speak the uh, properly. He didn't like uh, he didn't uh, I shouldn't say didn't like he didn't want to represent orthodoxy as they would with broken English. That, he said, was no good. You can't do that. We're living in a world in which we have to fight. He was an avid and a fighter of the conservative reform. And he said, we have to fight them with their game. And if they're the only educated people who can use such words, then the people are going to go to them. They don't want their rabbis ignorant. So as a result of that, it was a very big push in YU, Yeshiva University, to have their rabbis have a very nice vocabulary, be able to speak the, uh, speak the talk, uh, talk to talk. Yeah. Was this the same, was it from the same place that, that the Yeshiva students, the, the, the Bokum should dress well, and wear suits, and in order to present themselves as men of standing in the community? That was, that was more uh, Rabbi Assumption of Hall Hirsch. Okay, I heard you say that. Yeah, that was more Assumption of Hall Hirsch, who was saying Torah and Derek Eretz. The Rav wasn't against it. I mean, uh, he would go with that. But, and, I, and I also would guess, by the way, from the way that Rabbi Assumption of Hall Hirsch wrote, uh, he wrote in German, but we translate to English, but it's, uh, he was also using Hochdeutsch. He was, uh, you know, 
the high level German. He wasn't using the regular German. Again, showing that sort of thing, Torim Derech Eretz, you have to use the language, otherwise people are going to go away. So the Rav may, uh, was certainly influenced by that also, and bring it, but like I said, YU really encapsulated that. When I, went, when I was going for my interview at YU, for the rabbinical school, I remember I was speaking with the, uh, I forget what he was at that point, uh, but it was Rabbi Israel Miller. I remember that so well. And he said to me, why are you coming to Yeshiva University? Now, I had gone through three interviews to get into the school already. I was tired of, I was really tired of the interviews, but I was, I was trying to get in. So, but you know, you go, you go. So he said, why do you want to come to Yeshiva University? So I said to him, because I want to learn how to be a rabbi for the Orthodox community. He said, oh, then you can come in. If you would have said, I want to learn Torah, I would have told you to go to a different, different yeshiva. We, uh, we make rabbis, we make professionals here. We don't just teach you Torah. So it was a d dual program they were doing, it, but they were very proud and staunch about that program that we not only put out our uh, rabbis, that they, are, they, can, they compete with the greatest rabbis in the world, no problem. That we expect. But you also have to be able to compete with everybody else. And for that, you have to have an education. For that, you have to be polished. You have to learn how to do homiletics. You have to learn how to do all these things. And that's part of the program. And if, you do, if that's what you want, this is a school for you. If you just want to learn, go to another yeshiva. You don't have to, uh, don't, don't waste our time or yours. And it was so startling for me to hear that from somebody. In Hebrew, is there the same disconnect between the average spoken Hebrew and the higher level Hebrew? In Hebrew, there's only one Hebrew. There's not a higher or lower. Well, there's no, nothing English, I, know I mean, there's big words and there's people that use the small. Oh, so, okay. So the, uh, in Hebrew, is the same thing kind of? I, I'm sure that there is... So I'm sure that there may be language that you wouldn't normally use on the street in Hebrew. Yeah. But it's um, like in the professional journals. I'm sure they have those terms. But for the most part, the, uh, they're not going to try to dazzle you in Hebrew. <laughs> not like German. High German. Right. So that, when Hochdeutsch was very different because my, my father, who was born in Germany, I, t I told the story many times, but when we went to the consulate and there was uh, the, the German consulate and he was, somebody was speaking German. So I said to the, my father, what's he saying? He said, oh, that's Hochdeutsch. I don't understand Hochdeutsch. It's a totally different language. Mm -hmm. uh, and my father was born and he, knew that he spoke the language as a, as, a, uh, as a native, like I speak English. So, yeah. But in English you have also that the co collegiate English and you have what we normally speak. In Hebrew, I'm not sure if they have it. I don't know. There will be the ones they ask would be the college professors of he, of Hebrew. Well, like I said, they probably have their it's philosophical man, language, but yeah, vernacular. Yeah. yeah. If you would listen to a, a rabbi like Rabbi Aaron Lichtenstein from from Israel, you better have a good Hebrew vocabulary, because mm. he's not going to use the regular language. He wants to show he was the Rav's son. He is a Rav's son-in-law. He's, he's still alive. So he, he was the son-in-law of the Rav. And in order to marry into the Rav's family, Rabbi Soloveitchik, you better be somebody. <laughs> you better have a good education, otherwise you're not going to make it to that family. And But they say that his Hebrew is impeccable. And I mean, I don't, I don't listen to him, but it's I haven't really heard him for a long, uh, for a long time. His English certainly is, is unbelievable. He's like his father-in-law that way. But, but that's what, like I said, they wanted to do that. They swallowed the dictionary on, person, on purpose. Okay, so God's miraculous boon of chesed imposes upon man the absolute obligation to fulfill the great command which cries out from the very midst of the miracle itself. A transcendental commandment always accompanies a miraculous act. Command the Israelites. Woe unto the beneficiary of a miracle if he does not recognize the miracle be performed on his behalf, if he is deaf to the imperative which echoes forth from the meta-historical event, how unfortunate is he who has enjoyed God's wonders if the spark of faith has not been kindled within him, if his conscience 
does not tremble and take heed at the sight of the extraordinary occurrence. Now, uh, for those, I think it was only, no, were you here on the Lunch and Learn this past week? I was not. Okay, so your boys were. So we on the uh, Lunch and Learn, as Bill knows, we talked, actually it was interesting, we were talking about miracles, everyday occurrences, and I hope they enjoyed it. They did. Okay, and as far as the real, uh, the miracles that we all consider a miracle. But what the Rav is saying here is, if you see miracle and you're not affected by that because you're so dense, I feel bad for you. <laughs> it's, it's, it's saying, woe to that person, how unfortunate he is. You have a miracle right in front of you and you don't recognize that? Well, that's how disconnected you are. Mm. And as a result, you won't be able to grow from it. Okay. And that's what he says here, next paragraph. When a, miracle, when a miracle does not find its proper answering echo in the form of concrete deeds. By the way, why, why, would, you, uh, why would I have concrete deeds after a miracle? Brokers? Sorry? Yeah, say a broker, you say. No, no, no. In other words, I experienced some, he's saying, if, when a miracle does not find its proper answering echo in the form of concrete deeds. I see a miracle, I experience a miracle, I should have concrete deeds as a result of that. Why? It should be happy and... Uh, but why should I have God concrete deeds? What, what's con what does it mean to praise God? Connected. Why should I be connected though? Why specifically after a miracle? The, it's the same as the, as the woes that you're experiencing. You know, not why, I'm, why is this happening, but... It's happening. What do I need to do? What do I need to learn? What do I need to do now that I've been clued into this? Oh, oh clued in. Now, now so that, that, so awareness that, of this miracle, I need to then, what do I need to do? Okay. As, but the, the awareness of the miracle makes me aware of God. Yeah, yeah. In other words, why do we not follow the law? Think about that. Why don't we follow law? Why is it when you, I'm using a stop sign again? Why is it that when you driving at the stop sign, we don't always continually stop? We just slow down, glide through. If there's a cop there, we stop. Otherwise, we make our judgment. If the car is coming, we stop. But otherwise, we make a judgment call. Okay. No matter, I don't care who any, I don't care who you are. That's what's going to happen sooner or later in your driving experience. We make it. We make. But why? Because. We're in, charge. We're in charge. We don't think anybody else is watching. Again, if somebody's watching, you stop. You're not going to be nutty about it. So when it comes to any law, when it comes to a halacha, why don't we follow a specific halacha? We're not convinced that God's really caring, watching, maybe not even there. We're not so convinced. And then suddenly something happens. It concretizes that God is there. And then we have no choice. Our, we, we now have to channel that recognition into a concrete event and say, okay, I have to start doing Torah. I, I can't uh, fool myself anymore. I, I just experienced God. Okay? And that's why I believe. So that, you know, Mashiach, you know, it, it wants, you know then, then it's, the free will is gone. And right. But prior to that, so... Yes, it's, you know, isn't, is there another option? I'm just... To what? Late, to, to not following halakha. I, I, I should... A lot of options. I'm just tired, I'm lazy, I'm whatever. I absolutely believe, and I'm taking a hit on this, but I'm not going to do it anyway. I mean, is that, where does that... That, that, but you have to ask that, yourself... That's huge. Oh, you but know? you have to ask yourself again. If I really believed that God cares about everything I'm doing, how could I ever be lazy about so, it? So to arrive at that decision, I obviously don't believe because if it was that, if, that belief, if the belief was that clear, Correct. I couldn't. I can't do it, right. Again, I always go back to, if the cop is there, yeah. unless you're insane, you're not gonna do it. Or if the teacher is there in the classroom, unless you're insane or you don't care, because you feel I'm not going to get punished. Yeah. And then, by the way, that's why it is. I saw, I commented to somebody, I saw a, uh, one of the teachers, in my day, let's explain, I have to go back. In my day, and in, actually everybody at this table, in our day, we could goof off in class, 
we could speak to our friends in class, but when the teacher walked in, that's the end of it. Or even if we're trying to whisper, if the teacher started to walk down the aisle, you weren't stupid about it. You just stopped. Unless you were willing to challenge the teacher because you wanted a day off, <laughs> however it was, okay? Again, you had to be insane or you didn't care, whichever the case is going to be. You, or because you really felt that the teacher couldn't do anything to you. I had one student and I asked him, uh, he missed a recess, and I said to him, why do you do what you're doing? Don't you realize it's going to hurt you in the future? So he looked at me straight in the face and said, Rabbi, please. I'm in sixth grade. Nothing is going to happen to me. In the 11th grade, you'd have an argument. But sixth grade, you can't even give me an F. He knew. He knew. He showed me straight to my face. And I was looking at him with awe and disgust at the same time, thinking there's nothing. He's right. But still, there's no shame there. And so now, of course, the story I recently saw, I saw somebody talking. In, in, a, in a situation, and the teacher went over to them and said, no, stop talking. They talked like he wasn't there. I said to the teacher, I won't say who it was, I'm trying to be very, very uh, non-committal with this. And I said to the teacher, you know what it just showed me? It's totally the parents. The parents don't care. As a result, the kid doesn't care. So again, if I think there's no repercussion to what I'm doing, I see the teacher. I know the rules, but I know there's no repercussion. I'm not going to do it unless I want to, which would be your laziness, the indolence that we have. When we, cause we're saying, God's not going to punish me for this. How many people break Shabbos? How many people don't make brachas? How many people don't go to shul? How many people don't go and continue on the line, if you will? God, if I do it, so good, I get a reward. If I don't, so I don't get the reward. Would you do that for work? Would you do that for anything else that means something to you? The answer is no, of course not. When it comes to something we care about, we're going to do it. And quickly, very quickly. We're going to make sure it's done. But that's what the Rav is telling us. You're kidding yourself. You can believe, you can do this. But when you experience that miracle and you realize... That, that, that God's there, right there and there? <laughs> There's no way that cannot turn to concrete action. Must come together. Because you're in a realization at that point. That's what he's saying. Again, that's my belief on what he's saying. If his students want to disagree with me, that's up to them. But I, 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 That's just, that's huge. Yes. I know. I mean, you know, people, you know, I'll, I'll put it in first person. You know, I walk around. I'm a firm guy. I, uh... Really? You know, I, I, you know, Amuna, I've got it. What? Right. Really? I, 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 I guess not. I guess I only think I am. He makes, he's correct. He's making us rethink our theology. He's forcing that. He's saying, hey, you want to walk the walk, you want to talk the talk, let's do it. But don't, don't say you're, you're this. If you're not living, if you, if you, if your actions aren't reflective of that, Again, he's saying, if you see a miracle, if you experience a miracle, and as we learned, a miracle is an everyday occurrence. It's just, what is a miracle, by the way? I said this in class, in the Lunch and Learn, which is not recorded. So that's, sometimes you have to come to class and see these things. Okay. But a miracle is, uh, the Hebrew word is nes, which means, which also means banner. It's a signet out there that I see it and I recognize, oh, this is what's going on. I have to choose to see it. And that's his point. I have to choose to see it. Once, and once I see it, if I don't act properly and put into concrete actions, there's a problem I'm having with it. And that's what he says. An exalted vision degenerates and dissipates, and the divine attribute of justice begun, begins to denounce the ungrateful beneficiary of the miracle. I experienced the miracle. It should have turned into concrete terms because I recognize God now. I recognize God cares about me. I recognize God's everywhere watching what I'm doing. And I decide I'm not going to do anything. So God says, guess what? The attribute of justice is now going to take over. And again, go, let's go back to the stop sign. You saw the cop there. You decided, to heck with you. I know better. You drive through. The cop says, 
Whoa, what are you doing? Pulls you over, gives you and says, didn't you see the stop sign? Yeah. Oh, even better. I'm going to take you. I remember I was in driving in, uh, in Canada. I was a rabbi in Canada and the train was coming. So as the train was coming, I didn't want to wait for it. So I went around. I really didn't see the stop sign. I didn't see it. And I was going down and I saw the red light. I stopped the red light. Next thing I know, the cops behind me. Woo -woo. So what I do? He said, did you see the... Uh, you know, he's a, he knew me because I had the clergy thing, and I was the only rabbi in town. So he said, Rabbi, you know, even if the train is coming, you still have to stop at the stop sign. I said, there was a stop sign there? So he looked at me, he said, he said to me, if you didn't see the stop sign, I have to ticket you. If you saw it and just made a mistake, I don't. I said, Oh, that stop sign. Because <laughs> he was telling me, I don't want to take it. You're a rabbi. I'm not going to. He didn't want to. In Canada, apparently, they're very religious. They don't want to take on the clergy. Okay, at least in what I was there. But I actually went back to see the stop sign. Yeah. I had to see what I missed. I, I was so curious. How did I, And I was thinking, it's so big. How did I miss it? But it's uh, that's what it is. If you miss the sign, the cops are going to pull you over. God's going to say the, the attribute of justice is kicking in here. Because you didn't see it. You didn't recognize what's in front of you. So now I'm going to make you recognize it. You, had, I could, you could do it the easy way or the hard way. We'll do it the hard way. Do it's up to you. Do you want mercy or do you want justice? Right. That's all. How does this work on the small side, though? I mean, the next I, that I took a breath. I mean, look at biology. Look at, you know, right. you know that we're here. I mean, and you, you, you ponder that for a, a, a bit, and it's, yeah, you, know, you, you can't get your head around it. It's, you know. Okay. If you're at that level, so then you're going to appreciate God all the more so. But and again, you're going to re, it's going to reflect on your life. The question is, what do you do? In other words, he's <laughs> saying at whatever level you're at, if you recognize that God is there, and you don't answer it in a concrete manner. You're stepping up for yeah, what are you doing to yourself? Do you, you really need me to slap you? Why do you need that? You're recognizing it's me. So again, does it happen instantaneously? No. Hashem, Hashem knows his creations. He knows his children. Well, like we know our children. And the cop knows us sometimes and says, okay, it's been a long day. How many times does he pull over a woman with the kids screaming in the car? And he's, and because she did something wrong and she knows she did something wrong. And he says, you know, you did this. She said, officer, I know. God knows I know I did something wrong. You pulled me over. I must be wrong. But they were yelling. They were screaming. And he has compassion on that person and says, okay, you know what? Be careful and go on. That's happened more than once. And I've heard a thousand stories about that. My wife's grandfather always would say, when a cop pulls you over, you never think you did nothing wrong because they pull you over. You did something wrong. Just cop to the people. Just say, I'm sorry, and get over with. Because you know you were wrong. They don't pull you over for nothing. And that's, uh, that's something that he's learning. Uh, he learned the hard way, too, namely the Holocaust. But he's following the Rav's philosophy here. If you experience something, appreciate it and change that into concrete terms. Otherwise, it goes the other way. And look what happens here. He says, the Almighty uh, sought to make uh, Hezekiah, Hezekiah, however you want to say it, if it's Hezekiah, the Messiah. According to the Gemaras, according to all over, Hezekiah, the King Hezekiah, was supposed to be Mashiach. We should have been free at last at that time. Okay, what happens? And Sancherev, the evil guy, was be Gogumagog, the final war. The attribute of justice objected. You performed to God. You performed all these miracles on behalf of Hezekiah, yet he did not utter song before you. Shall you then make him the Mashiach? Here, he's doing everything for you. You're getting riches. You're getting everything you wanted. It's a miracle. It's a martial miracle. And he didn't sing songs of praise before you? Then comes time of distress. The hour of suffering makes its appearance. Suffering is the last warning. Wherewith divine providence alerts the man lacking 
any sense of appreciation for the good he has received. One must respond to this last pronouncement arising out of suffering with alacrity and must answer the voice of Hashem calling out to man, where are you? By the way, what's that coming from? This comes from Ayeka. It's a very strong word. Ayeka is coming from uh, uh, the story of uh, Adam and Eve. Adam eats from the fruit and then he hides himself and Hashem comes into the garden, his spirit comes into the garden and what does he say? Ayeka, where are you? Of course, uh, Adam thinks, hey, maybe God doesn't know everything. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, uh, okay, uh, I'll, I'll hide a little here. I'm, I was hiding because I did something. So I, I was naked, so I covered myself. No, Ayeka is, is the introduction to conversation. It's just like, hey, what was happening? You know, I know what's happening. I'm God, for crying out loud. But he's saying, that's his point, that you have to respond with alacrity when he says, where are you? What are, uh, where are you? So you have to answer it. Judaism has always been very strict regarding the prohibition against missing the moment. Now we're going to get into a Musar here that an ethical teaching that is going to blow your mind. I'm going to go slow, but it's going to blow your mind, okay? It possesses a highly developed and sensitive time consciousness and views the slightest delay as a sin. You hear that? The slightest delay, that's a sin. There are occasions when a person can lose his entire world on account of one sin, namely, and he lingered. Your mitzvah comes to your hands. You're supposed to fulfill the mitzvah. You don't say, I have time. You don't procrastinate. You procrastinate, it's over. And he's going to continue. What is a prohibition against overdue pro sacrifices called notar, if not a matter of being late? In what does the grave sin of prof uh, profanation of the Shabbat consist if not for the performance of work one moment after sunset? That same, that very same work that had been permitted one moment before sunset. In other words, the action was not permitted. I, I'm sorry. The action itself was not wrong. I'm using a computer right now. I, nothing wrong with the computer. Computers are very helpful. It's very wonderful to use. If God forbid I was still recording one second into Shabbat, I've lost my world. I've created the desecration of God's name. Same action. Different time. That's what he's saying. Does not the culpable non-fulfillment of commandments often take the form of lingering, but for a few minutes? For example... Reciting the Shema after its set time has elapsed. Now, in South Bend, if you miss Zaman Kriyat Shema, I don't know what's wrong with you. <laughs> it is so late here. It's maybe 10.30. But okay. If you go to other places, though, it's much earlier. So, what happens? When I was in Yeshiva, I remember in Yeshiva, you would stay up very late learning Torah. So, my, my uh, roommate would set his alarm for Zaman Krishma, five minutes before Zaman Krishma, one of them in my roommates, not all of them, uh, one guy, because he couldn't wake up, so he would set his alarm, he would wake up, wash his hands, say Shema, go back to sleep. <laughs> because he said, I have to say Shema. The other stuff I have another hour for, but Shema I had to say. So he would, he would do that. I, I always said to him, once you're waking up, <laughs> so wake up, come minutes early, caught a minion already, no, I, I'm too tired. But that's what you do, because the Shema, if you say the Shema late, you've missed the opportunity. Even if by one second, by one, whatever it is, there's a time limit here. By the way, think about we're coming to April 15th, right? People are going to go to the last second of 12, 11.59 p.m. to get their thing out. If they owe the government money and it's stamped 12.01, they've just got a fine. That's what I've been told. I know, but I'm saying, let's say they didn't. Yeah. If they didn't, if it's if it's stamped 1201, you've just cost yourself more money. You just got a fine. 
If I if the government owes me, you can do it the next week. They, just, they don't pay you any interest. But for 1201, 1201, something I have a fine. Why? What's the difference? Are you, are you God? It's IRS. <laughs> Guns. <laughs> they have guns. They have guns. Okay, but that's what it is. So he's saying, if you miss it for a few minutes, you think it's uh, bad, uh, it's horrible. You take the lulav after sundown. I'm always supposed to take the lulav during the day. I'm not home during the day, so I take it. God won't care. I'll take it at night. It's just the, doing the mitzvah. No, you did it wrong. You did, and therefore you didn't fulfill the mitzvah. If I put my tefillin on, I put my headpiece here, I have not fulfilled my mitzvah of tefillin. If I put my, or here, wherever I'm going to put it, I have to put it in the right place, at the right time. If I put it on at night, I haven't done anything. So that's what he's saying here. And the like, the two kings of Israel, two kings of Israel, anointed of God and national heroes, sinned, Repented fully and confessed. We're talking about David and, and Saul. Okay? Watch what happens here, though. The sin of one was not pardoned right away, while God reconciled himself to the other and forgave him the very moment he confessed. It's not fair. <laughs> Fixed system, right? So let's look. God treated Saul in accordance with the attribute of strict justice and tore his kingdom away from him. However... With regard to David, God tempered justice with mercy, and he did not deprive David's descendants of the Davidic kingship. Why did God treat Saul with such severity and act so graciously towards David? Okay, God doesn't take bribes. God is not a human. Their hearts it's, were different. Say it again? Their hearts were different. Okay, let me hear. Uh, David really truly delighted in, in the law of the Lord and he uh, you know if he slipped up and made a mistake he was truly sorry about it right and it didn't seem like Saul had the same attitude or the same it says that Saul was a very he loved Hashem he would sing to Hashem he loved Hashem too but he didn't so not truly he went to go destroy the Amalekites he didn't, he didn't kill all of them he didn't left some of them alive and no, because he had his, he would have his reasons for all these things, but it wasn't for lack of love of God. He, he loved God. He was a, he was a great uh, that nobody condemns him for. Mm. You're going to see why he, you'll see what happens here, though. Okay, so he says, but the question is not a particularly difficult question. That's good. When a rabbi asks what's the question, and he says, it's not <laughs> not that difficult. So okay, the answer actually is very simple. David did not miss the opportune moment and confessed his sin immediately. Saul lingered just a bit, and because of this delay, his kingdom was taken away from him. That's the problem. Okay? When Nathan the prophet came to David and exclaimed, You are the man who, in other words, you stole the, 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 the example, of the, when Nathan came to him after the event of Bathsheba, so he couldn't come to David and say, you shouldn't have done this with Bathsheba because he wasn't interested in that. What he came up with was a parable in which he said, if a man, uh, there was a rich man who took the, uh, the lamb of a, uh, of a poor man, mm -hmm. who, and that poor man would have his, that little lamb sleep with him and everything else. And this rich man uh, wanted to buy it. The guy said, no, he just took it away from him. And then he slaughtered his, and he fed it to his friends. So, and David said, kill him. He's deserving of death. So that's when he, Nathan said, you're the one who did it, when you took Bathsheba. David, by the way, let's understand something. David could have said, whoa, 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 stop, stop, stop. It's not the same thing. Because she wasn't really married to Oria anymore because Oria gave her a divorce, like every soldier has to give a divorce to his wife upon going to the army. So she wasn't even married to him. So I didn't commit adultery. Another thing is, Oria is a rebellion. So he deserved to die because he just doesn't listen to me. I told him to go home to his wife. He didn't go on to his wife. He'd rather be with you. So he was a rebellion. He was a morad. So if he's morad b'malchut, if he rebels against the king, he's deserving of death. I did absolutely nothing wrong. According to the letter of law, I'm totally innocent. He could have said that and he would have been justified, 100%. What happens? He says, 
David started to confess immediately and did not put off his plea to God for even the slightest moment. What he said was, Chatati. He heard it, said, I sinned. Period. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Saul squandered that precious in this in, uh, inestimable moment after he heard Samuel's rebuke. Wherefore then did you not hearken to the voice of the Lord, but did uh, fly upon the spoil? He began to argue with Shmuel prior to confessing. And Saul said unto Shmuel, Yea, I have hearkened to the voice of the Lord, and I have gone the way which the Lord sent me. It is true that at the very in the very same encounter with Shmuel, with Samuel, Saul confessed his sin, broken heart and contrite. He did. In the end, he tried all the excuses, and then he realized I was wrong. Fine. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words. But his, confish, his confession was not forthcoming at the desired moment. And this slight delay brought about the loss of his kingdom. By the time he confessed, the decree had already been sealed and the situation was irredeemable. The Lord has torn this, the kingdom of Israel from you this day. Had Saul not missed the right moment, had he not tarried, then his kingdom would have endured. Now, again, put the musha to us. God gives us a chance every time we have the choice to, and not only God, by the way, anybody. Anybody can be Nathan the prophet here. If somebody comes up to you and says, you know, you did this uh, incorrectly or whatever the case, however they're going to phrase it, we can either defend ourselves or we can say, you're right, I was wrong. <clears throat> and th this really would work <coughs> well in marriage. And when you do something wrong in marriage and your spouse asks you, you know what, that, that, that hurt, or you shouldn't have said that, we immediately go on the defensive, always. I, you don't understand. No, that's not what you say. You say, I'm sorry. And you don't say, I'm sorry that you feel hurt. Because <laughs> you're not sorry. You say, hey, I'm sorry you felt that way. <laughs> it's not I mean it, but you don't do that. That's what you're saying. When the opportunity comes to you, you confess immediately. Start, drop all the pretenses. Drop it. You did something wrong. And you're being called out for it. So I'm sorry. You can either be like David, or you can be like Saul. And you can say, you can give all the excuses and finally say, I'm sorry. That's the attribute of justice coming at you at this point. Okay, That's what he's saying. Like I said, we can, we can really turn it into ourselves to, to see a lot of ourselves in Saul as compared to David. Most people are like Saul. But they want to defend their actions. And then, after they've done that, they realize, you know what? Really, there was no excuse for what I did. Fine. So I have to confess. And here's another one. What is the gist of the song, uh, the Song of Songs, if not the description of the tragic, paradoxical delay of the Sh Shulamite maiden, drunk with love and overwhelmed with yearning, when a favorable moment, replete with awe and majesty, beckoned to her, if not her missing that great, exalted, and momentous opportunity that she dreamed of, uh, dreamed about, fought for, and sought so passionately. The tender and delicate Shulamite maiden, impelled by longing for a bright eyed, beloved, roamed during sun strange days through the bypass of the vineyards and over the crests of the mountains, through fields and gardens, and during pale, magical, moonlit nights, during pitch black nights, between the walls, searching for her beloved. One cold and rainy night, she returned to her tent, tired and worn out, and fell fast asleep. The sound of the quick and light footsteps could be heard in the silence of the tent. On that strange and mysterious night, suddenly, the beloved emerged from out of the dark and knocked on the door of his darling, who had intensely yearned for and waited for him, and awaited him. He knocked and pleaded with her to open the door of her tent. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my undefiled. For my heart, my head is filled with dew, my locks with drops of the night. The great moment that she had looked forward to with such impatience and longing uh, materialized unexpectedly. 
her elusive, self-concealing beloved, tired of wandering in hardships, appeared with his curly hair, black eyes, powerful build, and radiant countenance. He stood by her door, stretched his hand in through the hole, uh, in, in, in through the hole in the latch, sought refuge from the dark of night, and wished to tell her about his powerful love, about his desires and yearnings, about a life of companionship filled with delight and joy, about the real uh, realization and attainment of their aspirations and hopes. Only the slight movement of stretching out her hand and turning the latch intervened between her and her beloved, between the great dream and its complete fulfillment. With a single leap, the Shulamite maiden could have, attain, uh, could have obtained her heart's longing. Draw me, we will run after you, we will be glad and rejoice in you. In, yeah, in you. But the heart is deceitful. And who can discern it? Precisely on that very night, a strange, stubborn indolence overcame her. For a brief moment, the fire of longing that had burned so brightly was dimmed. The fierce passion ebbed. Her emotions were stilled. Her dreams extinguished. The maiden refused to descend from her bed. She did not open the door to the tent to her handsome beloved. A cruel madness swept into an abyss of oblivion and indifference. The maiden proved stubborn and lazy and rained down a multitude of excuses and rationalizations to account for her peculiar behavior. I have to put on my coat. I have to put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I soil them? I have to get up out of bed. Okay. The beloved knocked again and again, and the more insistent his knocks, the louder they grew, the more her icy, defiling madness increased in, in intensity. By the way, if you really want to see that, you ask your children, you call your children's name, come down, uh, hello, uh, whatever, Judy, okay, and nothing. Judy, what? <laughs> Supper, okay. And you're waiting, waiting, waiting. What are you doing? I call you, come down, okay? And they're whispering, that's what's going on here. The more you, uh, the more you do it, okay, I'm coming, leave me alone. Okay. In the whispering entreaties of her beloved, uh, as, I'm sorry, as the whispering entreaties of the beloved pierced the sounds of the night, the heart of his darling became harder and harder like stone. The beloved continued to knock, pleading patiently, and together with his knocks, the clock sounded the minutes and the hours. The maiden paid no heed to the voice of her beloved. The door of her tent remained shut up tight. The moment was lost, and the vision of the exalted life faded away. It is true that after a brief delay, the maiden awoke from her slumber and, confused and startled, leapt from her bed to welcome her beloved. I rose up to open to my beloved, but she arose too late. Her beloved had stopped knocking and vanished into the darkness of the night. My beloved had turned and gone. Her life's joy was, had, was fled, her existence a desolate wilderness, an empty waste. The saga of her passionate quest began anew. She is still wandering amongst the shepherd's tents, searching for her beloved. And what the Rav is saying to us, and we'll have to stop here, is that if we don't take the, uh, the opportunity when we get it, we're going to lose it. Maybe for repentance, maybe for acting what we're supposed to be doing, uh, following the Torah, whatever's going to be. If we, we have an opportunity, we cannot be lazy with it. We have to just grab what sees the moment, as they say. That's what we have to do. And if we do that, then Hashem's divine mercy comes over us. If we are lackadaisical, that's when the divine justice takes over. So we have to decide on which side we want. And I'd like to stop here and...